Hello everyone, this is Daniel and this is going to be part four of my Preparing for the End Times series. And this one is going to be titled The Commendations um, of the Churches or to the Churches, I'll decide later. But anyway, that's what it's titled. And um, that title might be a bit interesting. You might be wondering why is it titled The Commendations uh, to the Churches or of the Churches. Well, the reason that is is because we're going to be looking at... Uh, the, the commendations that Jesus gave to the churches in Revelation as a basis for what the Lord is looking at whenever he evaluates our standing with him. And um, it also gives us a good idea of what we need to have in our lives and what are the things that God is looking at uh, that we need to have in our lives uh, that will uh, no doubt be uh, crucial in us uh, continuing the faith, and of course, uh, by us having those specific attributes um, being practiced in our lives, or practices, uh, having them present in our lives is something that is going to be um, something that is going to be necessary uh, as we go through the end times and as, and as we prepare for the end times. So, the last time, so last time, the last two times, uh, all throughout the series up to this point, we've really talked about uh, the events. We've really talked about the ideas and theology behind uh, where we are at as a church today. Where are, uh, what are, what are we looking at when it comes to the rapture, and what is it, uh, what is the deal with the mark of the beast, and how is, how does all of that look like? And so after we have covered that. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that there are some uh, things up ahead that we definitely need to be prepared for, especially considering the times that we are living in. And that is why uh, and that is why this now, this part, and the parts following this part are all going to be um, about us being prepared and us getting ready for those end times. So our proclamation today comes from Matthew chapter 25 verse 21. And it says this, it says, uh, this, is, uh, G this is Jesus talking, and this is in the midst of his, of his parable of the, uh, of the talents. So it says this, it says, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And so that right there is, um, is probably the commendation that all of us want uh, to strive for. This is the commendation that we all as Christians uh, really want to hear whenever we uh, stand before uh, Jesus on, um, on our judgment. Uh, we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what uh, the commendation that we are looking for, very simply. So, as we, as we discussed, we have to be ready for the end times. And uh, very clearly, what is our response to the end times? How, what is the biblical response to Jesus coming again? Well, we get a very, very good groundwork of this from 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. It says this, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, that's Jesus, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Now here's the key. It says this. It says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So right there from scripture, John is saying that if we have a hope of Jesus Christ, of him being revealed of second coming, if we are looking forward to a second coming, there are a few, there's one thing we need to be doing. And that is we need to be purifying ourselves. How pure? Just as he is pure, just as Jesus is pure. Uh, our work is never complete, but we are always striving in our sanctification as Christians. That is what we need to be uh, undergoing. We need to be purifying ourselves, and we need to be uh, undergoing the process of sanctification. Now, um, this is not the only command from Scripture that we have to cleanse ourselves or to purify ourselves. From 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So once again, we are commanded to uh, cleanse ourselves because of the promises that, that God has for us, because of what he has given us and what he has promised to give us. So we need to be definitely uh, be looking at purification. Um, so... How do we necessarily purify ourselves? Well, Jesus um, 
is a major part of, of our purification. In fact, Jesus is the one who cleanses the church. In Ephesians 5, uh, verses 25 through, se- uh, through 27, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with what? With the washing of the water by the word, the word of God that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So we look at holiness, we look at sanctification as being very, very major topics when it comes to um, our preparation uh, regarding the coming of the Son of God again. So uh, the one primary way that we are cleansed is, first of all, by the Word of God. Uh, what does that mean? That means that we are cleansed by the word of God. Word of God, as we read and obey it, uh, Jesus once again he cleanses the church by the washing of the water of the word. And one Peter, uh, chapter one, verse twenty-two says says this. It says, "Since you have been pure, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth." So note that's how we purify our souls by obeying the truth. Uh, and it says. Through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So right there, we have a command to love one another. And um, and our souls are purified in obeying the truth through the Spirit. So the Spirit is the one that, that gives us uh, some of that. that it's the one that, that's purifying us, but it purifies us as we obey the truth. So we need to read the Word of God, and we need to obey the Word of God. And this is why reading your Bible and obeying it is such a huge part of the Christian life and sanctification. You can, I don't think you can really undergo sanctification uh, without obeying the truth. That's not to say that you need to have a Bible in order to be sanctified because the other church didn't have a Bible. But what you did need to do is obey the truth as you knew it, the truth of God. Um, another way that we are purified is as we walk in the light. So it's so, yes, we obey the truth, but we also have to walk in the light. We have to have pure motives. In 1 John chapter 1, verse, verses 5 through 7, it says, This is the message which we have heard from him, this Jesus, and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if we love the truth and we um, want to purify our souls by obeying the truth, we cannot be walking in darkness because it says here that we do not practice the truth if we walk in darkness. So we need to walk upright. We need to walk the right way. And it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That's the brothers and sisters of, of um, in the church as we are brethren and, and uh, sisters and whatnot. And it says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the blood of Christ is what cleanses us from this sin. But what our part is, is to obey the truth and walk the right way. And so uh, that's very important. I think it's very clear. That's what we need to do. We need to uh, be truthful. We need to be uh, seeking the truth and we need to be walking in righteousness. We need to be obeying the truth, reading the Bible, obeying it. And we allow then the spirit and the blood of Jesus to do the rest. So... That's what we need to be doing as Christians. We need to be uh, we need to be go undergoing this process where we are where we are putting off sin, where we are um, not just becoming moral people, but that but that we are becoming holy people. Um, this is something that is not this is this is something that is rare in our contemporary world. We can we can see moral morally good people in the sense that maybe they're not out there pillaging and burning everything, but. To see someone who's really walking holiness, that is something that excites me personally. So, what are those things that we want to be walking in specifically? Well, now we are going to do a study on the commendable act, the, the actions that Jesus Christ commended the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches. And we are going to look at what exactly did he commend them for. And then in the next video, we're going to look at what did he criticize them for. And we're going to look at and also what else did he command them to do. So we're going to get a very comprehensive look at the things that we as Christians uh, ought to make sure um, is in our lives. Because, it, it, you know, to say that we need to be walking in the light and we need to be pure is, is fine and dandy. But... Um, sometimes people really need uh, specific examples, and we really have a very specific example from Revelation two and three. So we're going to we're going to be studying that. 
Um, if you want, you can pause the video, quickly read through Revelation 2 and 3 before we start this, and then uh, you can come back and uh, start it again. But anyway, we're going to get started. So, once again, this, this is some very interesting commentary on what Jesus expects from us and expects from his church. The first thing that you will really notice is every time before Jesus addresses a certain church, he says this. He says, I know your works. And this is something that he says seven times. Each time uh, before he addresses a church, he says, I know your works. Very clearly, Jesus does not judge us on our profession. He judges us based on what we do. And so uh, I don't think, I think it, it really could not be clearer that, um, that it is much more important uh, what we do as a result of our profession than just having the profession alone without any supporting evidence for it. So we need to, we need to be... Uh, looking at what we're producing in life. We need to look at our fruit. Um, just to give you a quick example, Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, he very simply says, um, wait, that's the wrong reference. So and, um, it's, he says to the church in Ephesus, he says in verse 2, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. So very simply right there, uh, that that's a list of things that Jesus commended commended them for. But the thing I want to focus on is once again the first four words. Jesus said, "I know your works," um, and again he says in verse thirteen to 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 the church in Pergamos, he says um, he says, "I know your works," and he says this seven times uh, to all the churches. So once again, very clear that Jesus looks at what we do, not what we profess that we um, that we are. So. What are those things that Jesus commended uh, these churches for? Well, I've listed out nine different things, uh, nine different categories of things that, that Jesus uh, commended them for. And these are going to be divided on a topical basis. So we're not looking, um, we're not looking at specifically like what was it with Ephesus, what was it with Pergamos, what was it with, with, uh, with Sardis, and so on and so forth. We're looking at... Um, on a topical basis, because if you just want to, if you want to go through each church and see what, what, what was the deal with them, you can just go in, through and read Revelation 2 and 3, and um, I think it was more interesting and possibly more edifying to look at this on a topical basis than on a, a church by church basis. So, the first thing that Jesus commended the churches for, he, this, this is something that he commended, uh, that was, that he commended for, four different churches for. In Revelation 2, 3, that'd be Ephesus uh, 2, 13, 2, 19, and then again in 3, 8. So that would, so those would be, those would be the churches of uh, Pergamos. Those would be, that would be also um, Theatira. And also in 3, 8, that would be That would be Philadelphia. So those are the, so those four churches. Jesus Christ um, commended them for their faithfulness slash faith and perseverance. Uh, I just want to give a quick example. Revelation two three. That's the, that's Ephesus. It says, uh, Jesus. I'm going to read it from the beginning. It says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And then this is what we're looking at. Verse 3 says, And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So that's just one example of Jesus commending the churches for, uh, for their faith and uh, perseverance. Now, uh, how important is this to us in the Christian life? Well, Four different churches were commended for this. So this is something that is uh, very much expected of, uh, of us as Christians. We need to be faithful. We need to, we need to uh, persevere through the difficult times. And we need to persevere in our faith. A few examples of this come from, well, first uh, one comes from Hebrews 10, uh, verse 23. It very simply says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. So that's right there, perseverance, that we Hold fast to our confession of faith in Jesus without wavering, that we are firm in our confession, that we are firm in our profession. And it says, for he who promised is faithful. So right there, we need to be, um, so right there, we need to keep our confession 
uh, without wavering. We need to be firm in our confession saying that, yes, I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I do believe in the things that he, he did for me. And we're, when we say that without wavering. Again, in Matthew 24, verses 12 through 13, it says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. So again, Jesus in Matthew 24, um, he emphasizes the need to endure and persevere. Another one comes from Luke chapter 9, verse 26. Uh, Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. So this is why we need to stand firm in our confession of God. This is why we need to endure. Uh, we cannot be ashamed of Jesus. We need to remain faithful. We need to, uh, we need to have uh, faith towards him, and we need to persevere, and we need to uh, stay loyal. Stay loyal to Jesus. That, that's what, that, that is uh, one major thing that Jesus is looking for, loyalty. And also, finally, Romans 5, verses 3 to 4. And Paul writes this, he says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. So uh, whenever we do go through hard times, that is what uh, produces perseverance in us. And if you're facing a hard time, just know that it's working good for you. It's working perseverance in you, perseverance that we are all going to need uh, going through the last days. So that's the first thing Jesus is looking for. He's looking for faithfulness, faith, perseverance, and I think ultimately what underscores all of them would be loyalty. The second thing that Jesus is uh, commended the churches for is patience. Do we have patience in our life? Well, that was something that Jesus commended them for. And if, and if he commended them for it, then imagine what Jesus has to say for people who don't have patience. Let's read it. So ex again, in Revelation 2.2 uh, 2, to the church of Ephesus, just to give you a quick example, it says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. So Jesus right there commends them. On their patience he says I know it I, I know how that you are patient I know that you labor for me so patience is obviously something that Jesus is looking for in us as well in Romans 12 verse 12 it says uh, very simply this is just in the middle of a sentence but it gives us uh, a picture already it says rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation continuing steadfastly in prayer so right there being patient in tribulation. Not only do we persevere through, through tribulation like we saw in the last verse, but we also are patient in it. We wait it out. We say, Lord, I trust in you. I am going to just, I'm just going to keep going through. I'm not going to fall away. I'm going to stay loyal. I'm just going to endure it. I'm just going to wait until this is over, whenever you say it's over. So that's what we need to be. We need to be patient. Again, in James chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, it says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Well, how relevant is that to this uh, episode right here? And it says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he, it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So once again, we need to be patient. Patient, not just through tribulation, but just patient, waiting for the Lord to come. Let's be patient. Let's 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 keep doing the, the the things that we know how to do, doing good to all. So being patient is very important. And again, one Peter, uh, chapter five, verse ten, it says, "But may the grace of all, may the God of all grace, who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you." So after we have been patient, after we have persevered. God, we have a promise here that after we have suffered a while and been patient, God will use that uh, that hardship to perfect us, establish us, and then, uh, well, after the hardship, He will establish us, perfect us, strengthen us, and will settle us. He He will have His peace, I believe, uh, surround us. So that's the second thing that they were that the churches were commended for, and they and two times they were commended two times for this in Revelation two to the church of Ephesus, and also. 219 which would have been the church of Theatira. So, what's this so the third thing that Jesus commended the churches for and this this was commended two times in Revelation uh 2 uh 2 that would be Ephesus again and also 9 and also 19 again which would be Theatira. Um he commends them for their continued labor and service. We as Christians, we need to continue laboring for God. We need to make sure that we are not um, becoming unfruitful. In Titus, uh, 
in Titus chapter 3, I don't have the scripture reference for this one, but I just recently read it. And it mentioned, and Paul uh, warned Titus to make sure that your works are not, you know, they're not falling off. Make sure that you're not decreasing in fruitfulness, but that you are increasing in it. It says in Galatians 6, 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. So it is expected of, of us that we would continue to labor and continue to serve the Lord. Um, and we should do this uh, not growing weary in it. Let's not, let's not grow weary in it. Because Paul says that in due time, we will reap um, if we do not lose our heart, and if we do not lose heart, and if we continue and push through. So this kind of uh, blends with the perseverance part and patience part as well. Um, again, in John uh, chapter 5, verse 17, it says, But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. So very simply, Jesus clearly worked jesus wasn't down here on this earth to um to just fool around and just you know throw a, a party he was here to do work and that's and we need to recognize that we as well have work to do it um on this earth and this is very clearly highlighted in john chapter 4 verses 31 to 38 this is uh this is the account of what happened after jesus had his talk with the samaritan woman and it says this it says in the meanwhile his disciples urged him saying rabbi eat but he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So look at that. That's what gives us strength, doing the will of God. It says, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Or it says, do you not say? There are still four months and then comes the harvest. And it says, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered, entered into their labors. So right there, we um, see um, that Jesus, um, in a way, condemns that saying, which is there are still four months to harvest, and then comes the uh, there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. So right there, Jesus makes it very clear: um, don't be don't be slothful. Don't don't just sit around and say, ah, we'll just do it later. You know, we still have time to do it. No, Jesus said, open your eyes. Look at the fields, and he was talking about pe the people. He was looking at the souls that were to be harvested for the kingdom of God. And he says, get busy with it. He says, get busy with it. And he says, I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. That The point here, um, there is a point here about how the disciples, a lot of the groundwork was set for them in order for them to start uh, laboring to harvest uh, the souls for the kingdom of heaven. But the point here is, is that they were sent to do work. And so are we, as Christians here on earth, sent to do work. We're not greater than our master, Jesus. We're not greater than him. If he had work to do, so do we. Um, so that's the, that's that. And uh, you might ask, well, what kind of work and service are we supposed to do? Well, very simply, you know, there's a broad variety, but... All but anything you do, the goal and the ultimate that you are working for is what is known as the Great Commission. And we see this in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Uh, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So again, he says, Go therefore make disciples of all nations. That means teaching people to um to walk as disciples of jesus to 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 hold and to do the things that jesus commanded uh mark sixteen fifteen. there's another reference to them to this and it says and he said to them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature so those two verses right there are, are a brief glimpse of the great commission and whatever you find doing the goal should be uh that whatever you're doing it is either uh it is either helping, you know, you're either helping to make dis, uh, people disciples, or you're helping to, uh, or you're helping uh, organizations, or you're doing something that is getting the the message of the gospel out. 
Uh, people may say, well, you know, I just clean a church or something like humble like that. And, you know, they might say, well, I'm not really, you know, doing too, uh, anything that really matters. Well, I would say that you are because if you are taking on menial tasks, um, then you are freeing up time for maybe more skilled laborers to uh, go and do other things. So, for example, if, if the pastor doesn't have to clean the church, um, if, and if, and if uh, a, a laborer in the church does it, then that pastor, for example, can have more time to go and disciple people and, and do things like that. So really what it's about is about uh, making this the mission. However you, however you support this mission, uh, whatever you do, uh, it's good as long as you're supporting the mission. So that's the, the, the work, the labor that Jesus wants us to continue in. The fourth thing that Jesus commended uh, the churches for, and this was this was uh, commended one time. This was commended to uh, the church of Theatira again. They were commended for their increasing works and faithfulness. So not only do we want to continue in labor and service, but we also want to increase in it as well. But make sure you don't burn out. That's an important thing. It says in John 15 verses uh, 2 through 8 about this, it says, uh, th this is about abiding in Christ and says, every branch in me, Jesus says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, that's God. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. So again, God makes sure and he does things to us to make sure that we bear more fruit and it says, you are already clean because of the word, which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides, it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So we see there that we cannot do this on our own effort. We can only increase in faithfulness as we continually abide in Christ and allow God to prune us and to uh, grow us in our fruitfulness. And then it says, um, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So Jesus' true disciples, they bear much fruit and they increase in fruitfulness. So it's very important to make sure that we are looking, that we are not stagnating in our Christian walks, but, we, that, but that we are growing in what we produce for God. Um. But I just want to make sure make sure that uh, people understand that this doesn't mean that uh, that that it's the quantity of the work that matters. That's not it. It's the quality of the work that matters. So instead of really being overly concerned about the quality of uh, the quantity of your work, look at the quality, and the quality should definitely be be increasing. What good is it if you offer Jesus, you know, ten rotten fruit versus one good fruit, right? One that he can actually use and eat. So um, Right there, the quality of the work is what matters. Um, so the next thing that Jesus uh, commends the churches for that I have listed down, and this was this is uh, and there's three different, uh, and this was this was uh, commended three different times to two different churches. So the re reference for that is Revelation two two and two six. So Jesus commended the Ephesians. Uh, for uh, for exposing those false apostles, or as I would say, false teachers, uh, in this outline, and they also and and also Jesus commended them for hating uh, for hating false doctrines, and then in Revelation, uh, and then Re and then somewhere else in Revelation, I don't know why I don't have the reference. There would have been another um, there would have been another church. I think there was another church that was. Um, commended for um for hating false doctrine but nevertheless what do, what does what does the bible have to say about about us so jesus right here he commends the churches for despising evil for dis, for uh for uh, despising false doctrine and for challenging false teachers do we need to do, do we need to do that as a church today um i think we do ephesians 5 verse 11 says very simply, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So it's not just even a sense that we are just passive about about heresy or about uh, wrong teaching, but that we want to go and expose them. It says in 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 1, 
Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. And that's exactly what the Ephesians did whenever they tested the, the, those false apostles. Um, it says, it says um, and you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So Jesus commended them for that, which was, which was, a, which was a good thing for them to do. Again, Romans 16, verse 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned. So, it says, make note of those who, do, who, 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 who carry themselves wrongly with the doctrine that we have. And it says, and avoid them. So, we are to avoid them, not have fellowship with them, expose them, um, and mark them as, as basically a heretic. Um, but we need to be careful with this. We don't want to throw it around too loosely. We need to recognize when someone actually teaches a heresy or when someone has just a difference of opinion than us. Um, the next thing that Jesus commends them for, uh, commends the churches for, is receiving slash hearing the gospel. In Revelation 3.3, 3, Jesus commended the church of um, Sardis. And he says, uh, he says, remember... Therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. So, right there in that context, Jesus is saying, is saying, remember how you received the gospel and how you heard it, and how you listened to it and how you obeyed it. So I think that right there, Jesus, in a sense, commended uh, that church as to how they received um, the gospel. And so, um, it's very important for us to, to receive the gospel um, in a good way. In Luke 8, 15 it says um, this was Jesus' parable it says but the ones who fell on good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience so this was the parable of the of the sower who sowed seed and all the different seed f fell on different kind of ground but the seed uh, which represents the the word of God um, when it fell on good ground um, it um, it became fruitful, um, at least in, um, I think in another reference, uh, Jesus says in this parable, I think in Matthew, that uh, then they sprang up and they bore 30, uh, 60, or 100 um, fruit, or they were, they were uh, that fruitful in that measure. And so we, we see this here again, but notice we see additional aspects here. It says, um, having heard the word with with a noble and good heart what did what did people do it who who receive it that way they keep it and they bear fruit with with patience so we see again uh keeping it faithfulness bearing fruit uh increasing in fruitfulness or um uh, just being fruitful in general general continuing you know your labor and service and being patient so again we see the need to receiving and hearing the gospel because the way that we receive it and the way that we um hear the gospel is the way uh, that we are going to react to it and how we are going to um, respond to it. And Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, it says this, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. And they, and said, they always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, br brethren, lest there be in any of you an, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So we need to make sure that we are ready to listen to God. We need to make sure that we are ready to hear his voice and obey it. Do, and that we do not harden our heart um, against him. And this is, again, why we need to be lovers of the truth. If we are lovers of the truth, um, I think that if we are lovers of the truth, that is, um, we are, in a, we are, I think, already secure because Jesus said um, to Pilate that um, all those on the side of truth listen to me. So that's why we need to be lovers of the truth. We need to be on the side of the truth. The seventh thing that Jesus commended the churches for is uh, for being spiritually rich. The, and the reference here would be Revelation 2.9, which would be the church of... Smyrna, so that would be Smyrna, uh, right there. That was that was commended for being spiritually rich. Um, it's more important for us to be spiritually rich than it is for us to be materially rich. Uh, John ten ten very very simply says, 
The thief does not come to accept to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I, that's Jesus speaking, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Um, so being spiritually rich, um, being joyful in the Lord, being, having joy in our salvation, that is another thing that, that God is looking for from us. Um, the eighth thing that Jesus commended them for in Revelation 3, 4, which would be, um, which would be the church of Sardis. He commends them for staying pure. He doesn't commend the entire church for staying pure, but he says that some of you have stayed pure. And so he commends them on that. Um, and what do I have to say about it? Well, again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, we already read this. It says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. In fact, in, to the church of Smyrna, Jesus said to them, You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So again, right there, Jesus is saying that these people who have remained faithful to me have kept themselves pure. And so we also need to stay pure as we as we go along. Even if our church is, is doing bad things, even if our church is holding on biblical doctrine, or if they're doing things that are not biblical, we need to make sure that nevertheless, we stay pure and faithful to God. And finally, the last one, which I think is is uh, one of the one of uh, the most important ones, uh, not to say that none of these are not important. There, I think they're all equally important. But there's there's special emphasis on this last one. It's love. Jesus commended uh, the church of Theatira about this uh, in Revelation two nineteen. I think he also may have commended. Um, no, he did not commend the church of Ephesus for their love. In fact, he actually criticized them for their lack of it. So love. This is very important, and quite honestly, we need to recognize as Christians that everything we do is vain if, if love is ultimately not the target of what we do. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 says, it's very, very, very shortly, it says, Let all that you do be done in love. Um, you see, we can, we can be adding all these different things to our lives. We, we, can, we can say that we're faithful. We can say we persevere. We can say we're patient. We can say that we're continuing our service to God. We can say that we're increasing in our works and in our faithfulness. We can say that we hate um, heresies. We can say that we received and heard the gospel pretty well and we reacted well. And we can say that we're spiritually rich and we can say that we're staying pure. But none of that matters if we are not growing in love because love, is what is the goal here? Goal. The goal here is love. Everything in the scriptures hang on the commandments that we are to love the Lord our God first and foremost, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. So love is really uh, the um, the pinnacle of this all. In one John four eight, it says about the person who does not love that he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So. We need to make sure that we are growing in all these things, but that we are becoming more loving people, that people, when they look at us, they can feel that there's something different about us, that they can feel there's that love in us. And finally, John 13, verses 34 through 35, Jesus simply said this. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? He loved us by dying on the cross for us. And he says that you also love one another. So in the same way that Jesus has, has loved us in a sacrificial way, we as well in a sacrificial way are supposed to love one another. And he says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So loving one another is a very major part of our Christian life and sanctification. So those are all the things that Jesus commended uh, the churches for. I'm going to read again the nine things and then give the scripture references in case you want to read about it. First is faithfulness slash faith and perseverance. Uh, Revelation 2, 3, 3, uh, 2, 13, 2, 19, and 3, 8. Patience, Revelation 2, 2, and 2, 19. Continued labor and service, Revelation 2, uh, 2 through 3, and 2, 19. Um, increasing works and fruitfulness, Revelation 2, 19. Despising evil, false doctrines, false teachers, Revelation 2, 2, and 2, 6. Uh, Revelation uh, 6, receiving and hearing the gospel, Revelation 3, 3. Being spiritually rich, Revelation 2, 9. Staying pure, Revelation 3, 4. And love, Revelation 2, 19. So those are the things that Jesus uh, commended the churches on. Uh, let's make sure that we are adding these things in our life. Make sure Let's make sure that we are seeing these things in our lives. 
And in the next video, we will be looking at the things that Jesus criticized the churches for. And let's see where they made mistakes that we may learn not to make those mistakes that they made. So anyway, God bless you in Jesus' name, and I'll see you all in the next part.